And uh, this is my first time at this meeting, and I have to say that it's one of the uh, most enjoyable meetings that I've been to, and to meet all of the long-term patients, and uh, it was very, you know, I learned a lot more at these meetings than I have had in uh, most of our uh, strictly physician meetings, so I want to thank all the participants that uh, kind of helped me, and uh, hopefully I can share some information with you that will help you as well. So I'm going to talk about the tools that we use to treat intraocular retinoblastoma. And as physicians, we have a limited number of tools to, to deal with these tumors within the eye. And our success is basically based on our ability to understand those tools, know the uh, effects of them, when they're best used, and to one, explain to you so you kind of understand those uh, and use them kind of in a mix and match to, uh, to try to treat retinoblastoma within the eye. And every eye is different, so that, and every tool has its uh, benefits and risks and its uses and things like that. And so not one tool is actually perfect for everything. And so, just like you can't build a house with just a screwdriver, even though you need one to build a house. Uh, and some uh, carpenters or craftsmen, they, they become very uh, dependent or very favorable to certain types of tools. And they use them, uh, you know, when I was woodworking with my father, he could use a chisel to do almost anything. But there was many more tools that did the same job, sometimes even better. So I'm gonna, gonna basically break down what we use for retinoblastoma as tools and give you kind of the risks and benefits of how they work. So it's really a small toolbox. You know, we have laser, we have freezing treatment or cryotherapy, we have uh, chemotherapy, surgery, and radiation. And so if I expand on this, I'm gonna take each one, and I'm gonna break it down into this type of format where you have the tool, which will be labeled at the top, and then you have the indications, like when it's used. And I'll make a little cartoon at the bottom where you can see you know, a kind of a visual example of what you use it for. And then the benefits, what it does well, what it's really good at, and why we like it for certain things. The limitations on what it can't do, or some of the side effects that happen with it. And then the complications with some of the bad effects that can happen with it. And so for each tool, I'll kind of break it down into this format. Some of the slides get a little bit busy, but it'll always be fairly consistent to this format. So the first one I'm gonna address is laser. And laser we use to um, treat smaller tumors. And it's used, uh, you can see the device we wear on our heads that while we were examining the child, uh, we can look into the eye and aim the laser directly at the tumor. Um, it, it requires a trained person to do so, and we use different types of lasers with different wavelengths to affect the tumors differently. It's nice because what you pointed at is what uh, is affected, and it doesn't have any other issues. So if we break it down into its indications, well, it's used for smaller tumors. Uh, Brenda showed a nice case where they caught a, um, a congenital retinoblastoma very early. They had small treatments, and they were able to be treated by laser uh, and no other systemic treatments. So small uh, subretinal seeds or small tumors, and uh, it can also be used in conjunction with chemotherapy to actually kind of uh, add additional treatment to larger tumors. Uh, and it's better, <laughs> let's get that out of there. Remind me tomorrow. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and, um, uh, so it's, it's actually really good because it can be completed during the exam under anesthesia uh, in just a few minutes. It only damages the tissue that you pointed at. Um, it has no systemic toxicity. Uh, there's really a relatively low rate of complications with it. Uh, it's widely available and uh, really has minimal long-term pain with, it, with the procedure. Now the limitations is that you need somebody who knows how to work the laser and knows how uh, to deliver it without having the complications. You need uh, to only treat the right tumors. So smaller tumors um, are what you can treat. Bigger tumors don't do well unless you can find it with something else. Uh, and there's other uh, things about the eye itself. So uh, the eye has pigmentation. The laser energy goes into the eye and the pigmentation takes up the energy and turns it into heat. The heat kills the tumor. 
If you have a very blonde, blue-eyed person that has a very minimal pigment, the energy transfer from the laser isn't as efficient, and so darkly uh, pigmented eyes will do better than lightly pigmented eyes. And it's your surgeon's uh, obligation to know how to treat that, and if they're not having uh, success with laser, it may be because of that pigment transfer. So some of the bad things that can happen, well, you can laser the iris. When that happens, it can shrink up. If it gets too hot, it can cause a cataract. You can cause too much burning in the retina and cause a hole in it. Uh, you can cause hemorrhage within the tumor. Uh, if you laser, there's some cases that are reported where it can cause weakening of the eye wall and tumor outside. Now, these worst case scenarios are part of the informed consent where you know that these are the worst things that can happen, but they don't usually happen. So when I, put, when I tell you all the horrible things that can happen at the end, they're usually much less common and we do a lot of things to try to prevent them, but they are possible. So here's an example. These are three small tumors treated with laser that have small scars. And that's nice. Here's a, um, a tumor, it's a larger tumor, that wouldn't be able to be treated by laser alone, but when you add it with chemotherapy, the chemotherapy shrinks it down, the laser finishes it off, and that's what we call kind of chemo reduction. Sometimes the laser energy isn't transferred, like I said, in, in lightly pigmented people. We can give a dye, uh, like a green dye, to the patient, and it can uh, be uptaked uh, in the tumors, and it can help with that energy transfer. And so here's uh, three cases uh, where tumors were treated with chemotherapy. They shrunk a little bit, but they didn't respond 100%. We used a special dye in combination to the laser to get kind of those scars that you see. And then we call that ICG, and that's kind of a little trick that helps the laser work a little bit better. So at the end of it, I'm going to show a couple references that are very busy, but I'm going to kind of summarize some of the results of those papers uh, in its effects, efficacy and its side effects. So the lasers actually can work really well in the right tumors, up to 100%, but it can work none, not at all if you don't use it in the right um, uh, tumors. And the complications are variable. We talked about those. But here's a, come a, a bunch of uh, references. This one uh, uh, Fabian paper looked at all the... Um, it was a meta-analysis of all the papers that looked at efficacy of laser. And their conclusion is when they looked at all of them, they couldn't find one paper that was randomized pure enough to use in their sample. So the long story in short of that is that we can't prove that it helps or not, or it doesn't help by the literature, but we know as physicians in the multiple papers that it is useful and we still use it in a lot of our, our treatments. Next local therapy is cryotherapy. Cryotherapy is basically a, a small probe that uses a gas uh, to make the tip of the probe cold. It freezes through the conjunctiva, through the sclera, through the retina, and freezes the tumor, which causes the cells to break up and die. And it, um, it creates this localized ice ball. And so it's good for a little bit bigger tumors. Um, that are located towards the front of the eye. And you can see in the little cartoon, you can see there's a little bit bigger tumors that are a little bit closer to the front of the eye where you can reach them. Uh, some group A and some group B tumors. Uh, and the other use for cryotherapy is it actually sterilizes and seals some of the sites where we give chemotherapy. So when we do an injection into the eye, we use cryotherapy to kind of act as a protective barrier so um, uh, retinoblastoma doesn't escape the eye when we use the injections. Um, the benefits is it's easy, it's quick to use. It requires somebody who knows how to do it. Um, you can put it exactly where the tumor is, um, and it has no systemic toxicities. Com limitations is that you can't treat tumors next to the optic nerve because you don't want to freeze the optic nerve, or, and it's hard to reach some of the posterior tumors, but you can do some things to get there. Um, you need somebody who knows how to do it, and it makes a bit, little bit larger scar than the laser because the ice ball has to freeze up, and it also freezes out, so the scars are a little bit bigger. So here's kind of what it looks like when you apply it to the eye. Um, wait, one thing I forgot to say is that the complications for this are a little bit more extreme than the laser itself. You can get uh, cataracts again if you freeze the lens. You can get hemorrhage if the blood vessels break during the freezing treatment. It has a little higher risk of retinal detachments, not 
tumor detachments, but retinal detachment that may require surgery, or what we call regmatogenous ret retinal detachments. Um, and it can cause a lot of extra subretinal fluid in, locally in the air uh, that you treat. So here's a picture of how it's done. Here's the ice ball, and you can see in the picture there's an ice ball covering the tumor, and there's the scar that it leaves. And compared to the laser, you can see it's slightly bigger. So overall, when you look at some of the early studies that uh, when cryotherapy was first used, it started in this 1968. So that was like when I was born. Um, and basically, uh, you know, it was fairly effective then, and in uh, about 79% of the time, it can control the tumor, and 60% of the time when you use it, it only requires one freeze, but you can do multiple freezes uh, to make it effective. So now we move to chemotherapy, and chemotherapy has really changed um, the way retinoblastoma was treated from you know, the movement from radiation to chemotherapy. And there's different classes of agents that are used, uh, all of them uh, focused at uh, kind of destroying cells that defy, divide quickly by targeting the DNA in those cells so it doesn't work. And these different alkylating a agents or topoisomerase inhibitors or anthracyclines uh, go after those mechanisms in the cells to kill retinoblastoma. And there's different drugs within these classes and there's different ways to administer it. And so I will go over some of the uh, ways to administer it and it ranges from intravenous, uh, meaning putting it in the vein and treating you systemically, periocularly, which means injecting it next to the eye, uh, intraarterial, meaning putting it into an artery that leads into the eye, and intraocular, meaning injection directly into the eye. So intravenous chemotherapy um, is used widely, and it's used for groups A through D. Uh, it's also used to treat extraocular extensive uh, and metastatic extraocular extension and metastatic disease. Uh, the benefits is it's um, been used for decades, and the symptoms and predictability of, the, of using these medications are, are fairly well known. Um, it's standardized, meaning that if you get a, key, uh, a standard regime of chemotherapy in one center, it's not the nurse that administers it in uh, Detroit is not going to give you any different chemo than the nurse that gives it to you in New York. So it's relatively standardized in the, at least the dose and the administration. Uh, it's widely available. It works uh, well for large vascular, vascularized tumors. So big tumors that have a rich blood supply uh, respond nicely, but it's not so great for seeding. So subretinal seeding and vitreous seeding, it struggles with, and will, um, that's one of its limitations. It does have the chemotherapy side effects that you think of with uh, changes in white count, increased uh, risk for infections, uh, and some of the long-term effects can be uh, hearing loss, second cancers like leukemia, uh, and higher risk for infections and complications from those. So it's not without risks, but it, it, but it is effective in, in treating those types of, of um, tumors. And here's an example that was treated with intravenous chemotherapy. It's uh, two large tumors that had shrunk down and then with the addition of a little bit of laser it works well. So statistically, there's many, many papers that show you know, the efficacy of intravenous chemotherapy for, um, uh, intravenous, uh, for different groups. And if you look at the red or the yellow highlighted areas, as you go from group B to D, the efficacy uh, gets worse, but it's pretty good up to 80 to 100% for B, C, and up to 50 or more percent with D. Um, so really, in the, the eyes that don't have a lot of seeding, intravenous chemotherapy works well. Shift to periocular chemotherapy. Periocular chemotherapy is where we um, use an injection next to the eye. And usually this is used in conjunction with either intravenous chemotherapy or other types of systemic treatment. And we use it for advanced disease when seeding is a problem and we want to treat that, uh, or recurrences. And uh, the benefit is that the procedure doesn't enter the eye, and you can give medication that increases the level of chemotherapy within the eye without putting the eye at risk from that. The limitations is that doing that, the dose inside the eye doesn't get quite as high uh, to be totally effective. 
Uh, it does require somebody that's skilled to give the injection not to have problems. And some of the complications of the chemotherapy outside the eyes uh, is scarring and decrease in muscle use um, and inadvertent uh, damaging of the eye with a needle. So really, when we looked at our experience with it over 10 or 12 years, uh, it was about 39% of the time it worked. And we had about 42% side effects of that kind of scarring. So in general, periocular uh, chemotherapy is an adjuvant, meaning we use it to help uh, intravenous chemotherapy. Uh, but as a standalone um, a treatment, it's not um, widely used, but it can be used if needed. The next is intraarterial chemotherapy. This is using a different type of chemotherapy that's direct, um, injected directly into the ophthalmic artery. Uh, that chemotherapy allows us to get a higher dose within the eye and a uh, theoretically lower dose systemically. Uh, the advantages is that, well, it can be used for uh, all groups, A through uh, D and some of the E's. Uh, it has a little bit better control of seeds than intravenous chemotherapy. Um, it is really good at taking care of subretinal seeds and okay at taking care of vitreous seeds, so it's good for that. We do give, in general, lower systemic doses. However, the, we still get uh, lower white counts with this type of therapy, so it's still chemotherapy. The chemotherapy goes through the artery and still gets into the system, but we try to use lower doses to minimize the effect. Of, compared to intravenous. Uh, the limitations are that it requires a skilled uh, interventional neuroradiologist or neurosurgeon that is accustomed to working with chemotherapy. And the last part of that sen sentence is very important because most of these people are very skilled at taking care of aneurysms and uh, strokes and all types of neurological vascular disease, but when you give them chemotherapy, they're not uh, aware of its toxicity. It's not like the dyes that they inject normally or the glues that they use to thrombose things. And there, there is a, a learning curve on how to do it properly and without a lot of complications because it is uh, a higher toxicity to the medication. And so the, the, the complications with this are exceedingly higher than, say, intravenous chemotherapy, uh, but the efficacy is also higher as well. So you can have vascular occlusion because the chemotherapy is toxic to the blood vessels in high concentrations, and you can get that in the eye. So the central retinal artery can go down and you can go blind from it. You can have choroidal uh, vessels that, that um, don't work because of the toxicity and that affects the vision. You can have uh, that affect uh, vessels in the brain. You can have a complication of, an, of a uh, catheter put in a small femoral artery in these children. So it's also limited by the size and age of the baby because the vessels need to be big enough to do the procedure. But overall, uh, you, it, it can cause fairly dramatic um, reduction in tumor size uh, with a lot less um, wear and tear, so to speak. So if we look at its efficacy uh, in, the, in the easy groups, I would say B, C, and D, uh, or B and C, it's usually 100% successful in controlling those eyes. In D and E, it becomes a little bit uh, less eff eff efficacious compared to, um, well, in general. Um, and then if you look at a nice paper by Dr. Munier, uh, he compared his intravenous chemotherapy use with his intraarterial chemotherapy use over his career and found that there was about a five or six month decrease in the, uh, the time that it took him to control the disease within the eye, and he had about, about a 40% um, uh, higher salvage rate for the eyes that he used. The vision was slightly better because he compared it to eyes that were renucleated um, that he couldn't save, uh, and the ocular toxicity was a little bit higher in the interarterial group compared to the ones with the intravenous. So overall, as you go with higher doses of chemotherapy to the eye, the local complications are higher, but the efficacy is as well. Intravenous chemotherapy is another way we deliver um, uh, chemotherapy directly into the eye. And this is uh, good for vitreous seeds. So you can see in the cartoon, if you have vitreous seeds, they can be challenging to treat. 
uh, with intraarterial, with intravenous, with periocular. And so intravitreous, meaning directly uh, injected into the eye, can achieve higher uh, levels of chemotherapy within the vitreous, and these is the best way that we have currently to treat these seeds. Um, so what are the limitations? Well, it, as you inject higher levels in the eye, you have higher levels of toxicity. So when we looked at the ERG studies of the patients that received the injections, for each injection, the ERG would go down a certain amount uh, by every injection. So the more injections you needed, the, the more toxicity you would observe, at least on the retinas function. Uh, you can get retinal necrosis, you can have um, RPE changes. So there's, there's higher toxicity with this mode of, of uh, injections, but again, it's, it's our best tool to get rid of these vitreous seeds, which sometimes are the reason we lose the battles and lose uh, the eyes in, in eyes that can see well. So here's a, um, a uh, baby getting an injection, and you can see there's a small, we use a very small needle, and then we freeze it with the cryoprobe, as you can see here. And so one of the agents that we inject uh, is uh, fluorescent, and you can see under the blue light, you can see the, the medication in the syringe, and then within the eye, it's distributed within the vitreous. So you can see how that uh, gets in there. And so eyes that have pretty dramatic vitreous seeding can actually get better. Uh, and before this uh, use of chemotherapy this way, we re really didn't have uh, a good way to control that type of disease. Here with really diffuse seeds, you can see after one injection, there's a nice response. So if you look at the statistics on that in some of the papers, uh, you know, seed control can be pretty high, uh, 83 to 100%, but also the side effects, again, are inversely related with its efficacy. Uh, you can have a significant amount of uh, ERG um, toxicity as well, and there's a bunch of uh, papers that kind of go over this, this in the literature. But the long or the short story on this is that it does work well for seeds. It does have significant toxicity. Um, and so that's kind of the price you pay to try to get rid of those. Surgery, we had a nice talk about a nucleation. And a nucleation is excellent because it can be used for advanced eyes or recurrent eyes. Uh, and the chance of recurrence in the eye is zero. But the limitations is loss of the eye actually precludes vision as well. Uh, and the need for prosthetics. And thank God for the ocularis that do such a wonderful job at trying to restore uh, cosmesis, and I, I think that was a great session from them. Uh, there, there can be surgical complications with nucleation as well. We talked about exposure and implant issues. Uh, you know, sometimes when you cut the optic nerve to try to obtain that uh, long surgical margin to protect you from dying that the other eye, other eye muscle nerves uh, that control the lid or the muscles, they can be damaged as well, and you can be stuck with a droopy eyelid. So all those things you don't know about when you're making these decisions, but those things really do happen and can happen. Um, and you, know, you can have an accidental rupture of the eye during the surgery. All those things can happen. They don't often, but you know, not, not too many people explain that to you before you embark on those uh, treatments. Here's an enucleated eye. Um, one neat thing is what well, we're going to move into radiation and plaque brachytherapy is use, use of a little radiation disc that you put on the eye. And it's good for solitary large tumors that are too big for cryo or laser uh, or recurrences that are uh, localized. And we, I used to call this my secret weapon of, of retinoblastoma because it is very uh, effective in treating large localized areas, but they have to be localized and they, um, and you, you still are using a low dose radiation, um, or a high dose to the tumor, but low dose to the rest of the body. Um, it requires a surgeon and a hospital stay. There's the possibilities of complications of perforating the eye during the surgery. Uh, it has long-term side effects of radiation damage to the retina. Um, but when it comes between losing the eye and having uh, radiation retinopathy, uh, most people opt for, for uh, trying to preserve that because we can preserve some vision. And here's uh, an example of uh, a 
plaque placement. This is a dummy plaque where we actually position where the plaque goes, and you can see with the dotted line, that's where the tumor that we want to treat is. We position the, the radiation implant there and then suture the real one in and let it sit for a couple days, and it cures the tumor. And you can see this recurrence on the a corner here was really hard to treat, and then after treatment, it, it shrunk uh, and went away. So even in the really kind of hopeless cases where you don't think that anything's working for these recurrences, a plaque sometimes comes through, and about 73 to 95 percent of the time, it will take care of that local disease for you. Um, but it does have, again, about 2 to 40 percent of side effects, which include you know, radiation changes and things like that. The last thing that I'll talk about is external beam radiotherapy. And this uh, is used for retinal blastoma in advanced cases or in a last-ditch ditch effort to salvage an eye or only eye. Uh, its benefit is it can control some advanced uh, disease. Uh, it does need a specific, uh, spe specialized radiation oncologist to try to minimize that. Um, it can cause radiation side effects, as many of you may know and have experienced. Uh, it can cause bone, surrounding bone malformations, uh, and it has the risk of second cancers. So I don't think I've used external beam radiotherapy for at least 16 years, uh, um, from what I can recall. Um, so here's kind of an example of modern day IMRT to try to minimize the dose to the surrounding bone. Uh, but you can see with the treatment plan, there's still some dosing that gets to that, and sometimes this low-dose radiation is more dangerous than the high-dose radiation to uh, certain tumors with, when you have a, a retinoblastoma primer. So if you look at that uh, statistics on external beam radiotherapy, we have long-term data sets on this, and it can control early disease in up to 82% of cases, and it can uh, control uh, late stage or recurrent disease in up to 50% of cases. Uh, however, it does have a high uh, amount of side effects that we know about. And that's a whirlwind tour of what tools we have in uh, intraocular retinoblastoma. I try to kind of cover the basics of every procedure, and it is kind of an art to put all the ones that you need to deliver the least amount of side effects to the whole person uh, to try to save as much vision and the eye. Uh, but those are the tools we work with, and the art is putting them together in the best way to make uh, things work well for all of you. Uh, thank you much. <clears throat> Question. Question. Uh, I have a question about retinal detachment uh, after cryotherapy. Uh, is that just uh, when the child is young, or as you age, do your risks of potential retinal detachment lessen? So, um, the retinal detachments, or the what we call regmatogenous retinal detachments, where there's a hole and fluid gets under the retina. Uh, associated with cryotherapy are from two reasons. One is that you know we destroy so much tumor that the tumor was full thickness retina that once it goes away, there's nothing to kind of separate those two layers and fluid gets underneath. Uh, and we see that in bigger tumors that we've uh, we've cryoed, and that's where we have that. Once we cryo an eye and and it doesn't have a retinal detachment, it forms a scar, and that that scar is actually an adherent retina and the risk of retinal detachment in that area actually is less. Sometimes when we have small holes in the eye, we'll cryo a hole uh, to seal it. And so it actually, for long term, it should actually be more protective than harmful. Could I, could I just add, is this live? Yeah, I'll try that one. Could I just add that if you cryo near calcium, which s fastens the retina down in one spot and you cryo, you change the you, you freeze and thaw, and that could, the retina can't, has no mobility to shift because of the calcium, and then you'll get a little hole right beside the calcium. So we try hard not to cryo beside calcium. And it's actually the mechanical indentation when you're freezing, and then once you do that on the calcium, it acts like a fulcrum and it can rip it like that. Yes, another question. No, we're right here. Uh, two questions about the. Uh, uh, short and long-term neurological effects of uh, intracranial uh, or intracerebral uh, um, chemotherapy, 
And then the second question is in uh, uh, fertility issues among the kids who had both systemic therapy and um, the intraarterial. You know, wondering if there's uh, studies of fertility in, in those survivors, and then uh, does it make a difference doing the local focal chemotherapy versus systemic? So I can, I can address a, some of those questions with the, regards to the neurologic deficits in patients that have had um, intraarterial chemotherapy. Uh, there has been a few anecdotal cases of patients that have had vascular events uh, neurologically. Uh, in our center, thank God, there has been none. Uh, however, uh, there, there are reports around the world that it can happen and it is rare. So long-term side effects from that, well, I think that the main uh, body of patients, you know, we're only about 11 years into it. So the long-term effects are at least 11 years old, and there hasn't been a, an untold effect of that that we know of. So really, that's unknown. Um, with your second part of your question was with um, fertility with intraarterial chemotherapy, again, uh, we're not in the reproductive years. However, we would suspect it would be minimal. Uh, and Brenda, do you want to comment on the fertility for intravenous? Um, I, I think there's not a large problem from the vincristin, the toposide carboplatin protocol. When you get into some of the other more uh, toxic drugs, there may well be. But certainly, many of the patients who've had the standard treat chemotherapy have fine fertility for intraocular disease. Now, for systemic metastatic disease, that may be different as well. Yes. I noticed that you didn't touch on proton beam. Is that kind of obsolete now in the treatment of retinoblastoma? No, but because I have not used the proton beam, I thought it would be unfair for me to comment on it. But it is another way, uh, another method of external beam uh, radiotherapy for that which you know, tries to minimize, again, just like IMRT, the different types of, uh, of uh, radiation. Okay. So, so I would say maybe proton beam for primary treatment, which is what you're talking about, is, is obsolete today because of the radiation impact, right. but it might well be the correct treatment for certain um, extraocular disease right. treatments. I wanted to ask about um, uh, the focal therapy at the same time with chemotherapy? I mean, like, uh, what's the best uh, way we should um, proceed? Uh, like giving chemotherapy one hour before, after the focal, or what do you recommend? So what we typically do, and I may not be the, um, the norm, but what we would typically do is do our combination adjuvant treatment, meaning laser cryotherapy, uh, one month after a cycle of chemotherapy. So we would see the patient, they would receive their chemotherapy, whether it be intraarterial versus intravenous. One month after, we would see the reduction in tumors, and if there was residual disease, uh, treat or not treat that residual disease with focal treatments. And we would do that every cycle until we were satisfied that the amount of residual disease uh, was down to a point that we didn't expect it to come back. Another question that I have, I'm sorry, is about intraarterial uh, treatment. Is that uh, I think in Latin America, uh, uh, for at least in Central America, we don't have that, and we haven't been able to to have access to that. But what I'm asking is about how to get expertise in something that is so, uh, I don't know how to say, complicated maybe, that because there is like a learning curve and everything, but you're not going to learn in a patient. So exactly. And how so can you do that? I, I think that I, my gut feeling is that we're gonna come up with something better before the rest of the world can catch up with intraarterial. And my hopes is that you know, through some other type of methodology that we won't need all this complex um, uh, treatment. But for now, if you have something like that and you think that it's optimal and you need that, uh, I would refer it to some place that does have it. Uh, because the investment in time, uh, learning, expense uh, is, is, is massive. Uh, and it's, it, yeah, it's, it's a difficult curve. 
Could I just address the, your first question, though? You were asking, do do we still do the combined laser combined closely, simultaneously with the delivery of intra-arterial, intravenous intra chemotherapy. There was a wave of that. It was thought that, that heating the tumor while it got, the, it got the chemotherapy would make it more effective. I don't know of anywhere in the world that that's being done now, and we never did it in Toronto because we had no capacity in our institution to be actually doing that, and there was no good evidence that it made a difference. Yeah. And that was the true days of thermotherapy, and I think yes. we do more photocoagulation than thermotherapy. Thermotherapy is when we heated the tumor to a certain non-denaturing uh, temperature where it would cause the cells to go into apoptosis, whereas photocoagulation, we actually just denature and kill the, pro uh, the proteins in the cells. I think most of us all use uh, photocoagulation, you would agree? Absolutely. We'd much rather now kill the tumor. And in fact, the other gentle heating was called TTT. Mm -hmm. And you'll still see that referred to. Uh, I, in my ex we've never done that, and we think it's better to burn the tumor and get rid of it. And I think that you see TTT used uh, because of its historical thing, but it's not actual TTT. <laughs> yes. Okay, so maybe I'm taking this a little different direction than some people are asking questions, but I'm curious, what's your opinion in the likelihood, or is it realistic, like, say, in my lifetime, to reattach a detached retina, like, to hopefully maybe even have sight back? Is that likelihood or not? Well, it depends on the state of the retina, and I think that in, in my lifetime, I've seen some of the advances with, with retinal regeneration and things that I never thought I'd ever see, so I, I think that it's possible. There's some retinas that have been detached and scarred up for so long that the possibility of them going back would be fairly unlikely. But I never say never. Okay, because the question came up yesterday of one of the doctors. They said, well, then what's the likelihood that your brain would even be able to communicate? Like, yeah, you reattached it, but is your brain going to even communicate to have vision if it's been, you know, years? Yeah, it's a complex system, and, you know, the, the retina... Uh, almost thinks before it talk, tells your brain that there's something going on. So uh, it's not as straightforward as a mechanical fix. Okay, thank you. Yes. Um, for those very advanced say, uh, tumors, so not responding to systemic or even intra-arterial chemotherapy, so, so for the next step, would you recommend the patient to try plaque radiotherapy or go ahead for education for those unresponsive eye? Could you repeat that one more time? Oh, I'm asking, so for some patients, so they have a very advanced uh, retinoblastoma, so they refuse education in the start, so they try systemic or even IEC, uh, but they are still not, very, uh, not, still not responsive. So the next step, would you recommend them to try plug radiotherapy if, if the parents still refuse education, or would you recommend, highly recommend education for those unresponsive eyes? It depends on... You know, if the tumor's not controlled in a localized fashion, like I said with plaque, it's good at getting rid of small areas of localized tumor. But if it's a diffuse recurrence, it, 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 a nucleation would be better. Um, good. I, I, see, I see that uh, Thomas is indicating there's a question from the internet. Yes, live stream question. So we have a question regarding the interarterial chemotheory, um, chemotherapy, whether or not, well, how can you know if the child will be safe if the cancer is already in the choroidal or the optic nerve? The long story is you can't. Uh, the dose of chemotherapy given to the optic nerve and choroid are very, very high. Compared to uh, intravenous chemotherapy, it's about 100 times the concentration of chemotherapy. So if the tumor is responsive, that whether it be in the optic nerve or choroid, it will be exposed to that level. Whether the presence of that tumor being in those areas have already uh, went to other parts of the body, just like high-risk features if the eye was nucleated, we don't know. And it puts the child in the same situation as if they had their eye removed, uh, is that there may be uh, a chance that there's a uh, tumor elsewhere. Um, so you don't know. Could I just add to that, Brian? Um, if 
that that may what you, your answer was referring to the child and the dose of chemo coming into the eye, but the longer the patient keeps getting more intraarterial injections because things aren't quite going well, uh, the greater the risk is surely that the tumor is then getting outside the eye and endangering the child's life. Is that correct? As as it is with any type of recurrence, you know, whether it be intraarterial chemotherapy or or uh, failure for intravenous chemotherapy. If there's residual disease and it's progressing, uh, there's a risk for, for stem, systemic. I don't think it's specific to the type of treatment that we use, it's just the uh, residual disease. I, I see there's more questions, but we must give Bhavna a chance to talk, so hold your questions, don't forget them, and after Bhavna's talk, bring them up. But we will, I will now introduce Dr. Bhavna Chala, my very good friend who's invited me to her home in New Delhi, where we had a wonderful time. And uh, um, you heard yesterday about the, uh, the success of her uh, unit that she leads, becoming the hub for retinoblastoma for the whole of India in its many diverse capacities. And we're very excited about that, Bhavna. Thanks, Dr. Brenda. Very good morning to all of you. At the outset, I would like to express my gratitude to the organizers of this meeting for having me here. It's my first meeting at this One RV World, and I'm really very, very excited to be here. Thank you once again. So I'll go on with my talk. Brian has very nicely covered all the different aspects of treatment with regard to intraocular retinoblastoma. But what bothers us in the developing world is extraocular disease because orbital retinoblastoma constitutes a very large proportion of patients that we see. So I'm going to devote the next few minutes discussing about the treatment of orbital retinoblastoma and how we go about doing it at our center. So like yesterday, we had this discussion on the session on uh, uh, retinoblastoma in the developing world. Uh, Dr. Arun very nicely showed how you know the annual incidence of retinoblastoma worldwide is about around 7,000 new cases every year, but Asia itself accounts for more than 50% of these cases. And not only that, because we have much more advanced disease in countries like Asia, we also account for more than 50% of the worldwide mortality of retinoblastoma. And very alarmingly, India has the highest number of retinoblastoma cases in the world. We have a population of 1.3 billion, and it is increasing by the day. So we have a lot of numbers to grapple with. Now, I come from Delhi, which is the capital of India, and this is my center where I work. It's the All India Institute of Medical Sciences, which, are, which is a tertiary care center located in North India. And here we have a dedicated retinoblastoma clinic where we treat about 300 new cases every year. Now, we all know that the goals of therapy are saving the life of the child, saving the eye, and saving vision wherever possible. But of course, the goal, whatever goal we set, it is mainly determined by the stage at which the child presents to us. And this is the paper which our group published in the British Journal of Ophthalmology, which showed that in our clinical setting, extraocular disease formed more than one-fourth of the children that presented to us. And this was an alarming figure. Now, we all know from previous studies as well as ours that extraocular invasion is predictive of low survival. So what are we doing to treat these children? So that comes to the topic of my talk, which is orbital retinoblastoma mission possible. Now, in the past, we are aware that orbital retinoblastoma was treated with orbital excentration, but that is no longer the case because there is increasing evidence that a multimodal treatment approach improve, improves patient survival without the need for orbital excentration. However, when you look at literature, there are several lacunae in the studies that have addressed orbital retinoblastoma. Most of them were carried out on heterogeneous populations, meaning that different stages of the disease were included. They were retrospective in nature. There were few number of cases that were included. Different classification systems were used, and there was a lack of consensus on chemotherapy protocol. So we were at a loss as to what is the standard of care for children with orbital retinoblastoma. So we did this study, which I would like to share with you today, which was published in Ophthalmology in 2016, where we did a randomized prospective study, including patients of orbital retinoblastoma, to try and find out if we can determine a standard of care for these children. 
So this was a study which were, where the patients were recruited prospectively. We took a prior approval from the Ethics Committee of our institute and the period of recruitment was from 2011 to 2014. And we included children with stage 3A retinoblastoma, which is the Chandida classification, the IRSS, IRSS classification that we use for extraocular disease, meaning thereby that these children all had overt orbital disease without lymph node metastasis. So those patients with metastatic disease that was stage four IRSS, those children with had history of prior treatment and those who were not willing to participate were excluded from this study. So we recorded the baseline history, the demographic details like we do in any other study, we did an ophthalmic general physical and systemic examination and proceeded with imaging which mainly included an ultrasound to confirm the diagnosis of retinoblastoma, a contrast enhanced MRI of the orbits to, uh, to define the staging of the disease, the local spread and then the incision biopsy of the orbital mass in case the tumor was unilateral. In bilateral cases we didn't have to do an incisional biopsy. Now, in the methodology, uh, we uh, proceeded with all the investigations, you know, we have to do an extensive systemic workup for these cases, and we have a team comprising of a pediatric oncologist, an ocular oncologist, a radiation oncologist at our center. So all these investigations were done before the patients were recruited into the study. And then we used our multimodal protocol where uh, all these children were treated with three to six cycles of neoadjuvant chemotherapy followed by enucleation followed by external beam radiotherapy and the remaining cycles of adjuvant chemotherapy. Now, uh, these children were randomized into two groups according to the treatment protocol. Group A cases were treated with a triple drug VEC chemotherapy and group B cases were treated with a five drug combination which I'll be discussing more in more detail. This is a busy slide but what it shows is that the two chemotherapy protocols that we use for group A and group B patients, for the group A we had the VEC where we stepped up the dose of etoposide uh, to 12 milligrams per kg and of carboplatin to 28 milligrams per kg. And for group B, we used eight cycles of alternating uh, drugs, which included uh, the wingristine, cyclophosphamide, idorubicin in one cycle, and etoposide and carboplatin in the next cycle. So we used this as a five drug uh, chemotherapy protocol for group B cases. Now the response for, to treatment was assessed on clinical examination as well as on MRI of the orbits and brain and this was performed after the first three cycles of chemotherapy. Most of the children had a dramatic response to neoadjuvant chemotherapy and the, the eye became amenable to enucleation. So enucleation was carried out and like it was discussed yesterday, Dr. Brenda uh, showed us how uh, uh, we can use a polymethyl methacrylate implant, a PMMA implant, that's what we use, it costs less than $10 in India and we use that implant with a myoconjunctival technique and we get a reasonable degree of motility. So we don't use porous implants in these cases and the other reason why we don't use porous implants is because the, all these children are going to receive external beam radiotherapy and therefore it will interfere with the integration of the, of the porous implant. So this is an example to show how there is a dramatic reduction in the orbital mass after neoadjuvant chemotherapy. This picture is after three cycles of chemotherapy where the eye becomes amenable to enucleation. Of course, enucleating a thysical globe like this is technically quite challenging because there is a lot of adhesions and there is a lot of distortion of tissues, but we go ahead with enucleation. And this is, a, oh, below over here, you can also see the MR images of these the same patient where you have seen this massive proptosis with optic nerve disease uh, on the left side and on the right side is showing a picture after three cycles of chemotherapy. This clinical response is supported by the response on imaging. So uh, after doing the enucleation, we give adjuvant external beam radiotherapy to the orbit within four to six weeks of enucleation. The radiotherapy is given in a dose of 40 gray in 20 fractions over a period of four weeks as a two gray fraction per, uh, daily for five days per week. And then we continued the adjuvant chemotherapy according to the protocol for group A and group B cases respectively. 
So the outcome measures of our study, we wanted to see the efficacy, we wanted to see the toxicity. So the outcome measures were the survival probability, the cause of death in both the groups, and the chemotherapy-related toxicity, because that was very, very important parameter in our study. So this is another child uh, where you can see how the orbital mass, it responded dramatically to the new adjuvant chemotherapy. The picture on the right shows the, it shows the uh, photograph just prior to enucleation. So in our study, we recruited 54 cases. It was a randomized study, so there were 27 in each group. There were 32 boys and 22 girls. And the median follow-up was 25.4 months. So of these 44% children, unfortunately, expired, they succumbed to the disease. The overall Kaplan-Meier survival probability was 80% at one year and 42% at four years. Now looking at, this is the overall Kaplan-Meier survival, which I just mentioned, 80% at one year, but it dropped to almost half at four years. Now when we compared group A and group B, which was our primary objective, there were nine deaths in group A, which were treated by the VC protocol, and 15 deaths in group B, which were treated by the five drug regimen. And then we, when we compared the kaplan meier survival probability at one year in both the groups, showed a comparable outcome of 81% and 79%. However, there was a significant difference at four years. The survival probability for the VC-treated cases was significantly better at four years than it was for the cases that were treated with the five-drug protocol. So this is the Kaplan-Meier survival showing the difference between group A and group B. At one year, it is comparable, but at four years, it shows a statistically significant difference, 63% in group A versus 25% for group B. And coming to the cause of death, in the major cause of death in both groups was expectedly CNS relapse. We had lost eight children in group A and seven in group B because of CNS metastasis. Additionally, four children in group B died because of hematogenous metastasis. And when we studied the chemotherapy-related toxicity, we found it was much higher in group B. Two children in group B died due to sepsis following neutropenia. Now, the percentage of cases that had one or more episodes of grade three or grade four chemotoxicity were also determined to know which set of drugs is more toxic. So here we followed the NCI common terminology, the criteria for adverse event scale. We graded neutropenia into grade three, grade four, thrombocytopenia into three and four, and anemia into three and four. And here you can see the yellow bars which represent toxicity in group B is much higher than the red bars which represent toxicity of group A. Now, though they were higher in group B in each in each of the grade three, four uh, neutropenia, thrombocytopenia, thrombocytopenia, and anemia criteria, the statistically significant difference was found for grade four neutropenia, where it was higher in group B as compared to group A. So we concluded from this study that the triple drug chemotherapy with the VC combination was found to be more efficacious and less toxic as compared to the five drug protocol. And we recommended it as new adjuvant and adjuvant chemotherapy for orbital retinoblastoma. So thank you very much for your kind attention. I believe retinoblastoma is all about teamwork and together we will. Thank you. Bob, now that was excellent. I'd just like to, before we open to questions, and there'll be lots, um, but, but I think um, I want to point out, we've mentioned in this whole meeting, I think, two randomized studies, right? Myoconjunctival and Bavna's beautiful presentation now. That's two randomized studies. That's because we can't think of any others from anywhere else. Both of those are from India, and the rest of the fancy developed world has not produced a randomized study of any meaningful nature in retinal blastoma. Congratulations. This is kind of going back to the previous presenter, but um, I'm wondering if there's any thought of using stem cells to repair like the scars from retinoblastoma. And I'm thinking in the future in the Jetson age maybe, but I was just at a conference with orthopedics were using it and they were having good results. So I, I don't know if you know, a stem cell can become a cone or a rod or is there any research in that? There, there is. Um, it's, it's 
practical uses are, are not out yet, but there are lots of scientists uh, working on that diligently. And like I said earlier, I've seen it, the possibilities, you know, I always thought that it wouldn't happen. Um, you know, just, but I've seen the, the progress in, in some of these labs that you know, before my lifetime, I think that it that may be a possibility. So I don't know if anybody else has any comments on that. I think the retina is more complicated than the bone and much more complicated. And when we make a scar from focal therapy, we leave bare sclera. So you'd have to have something to rebuild a whole retina and its connections to this back cortex in the brain. Now it might be make a great place to put a, 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 a chip because it's got no retina in the way, but that's a different, that's a different story. Hi, my question is about uh, future treatments. So I'm wondering where will we, can we see treatment going in the next, let's say 20 years? That's a good question, and Brian referred to that, that mm -hmm. there will be new things coming. And the new thing coming is now in press, one new thing coming, which has been very difficult to get in press because it's so radical, it's so much against dogma that you must not put a hole in an eye with live retinoblastoma cells in it. But Meunier showed a safe way to do that, and it's being done to great success to treat vitreous seeds. And John Chow, faced with uh, almost as many retinoblastomas every year in China as in India, and he's caring for 50% of those all over the country. He recognized he was losing eyes and losing patients who would escape because they didn't want their eye removed and would disappear and probably those children died. So he started doing vitrectomy. So putting a, a vitrectomy probe, taking out all the vitreous seeds, but then you must also take out the source of the seeds, which might be a tumor at the wall of the eye in the retina that's still active, it removes all of those, uses laser, all sorts of techniques. That's now in press in ophthalmology, reporting uh, the first 21 patients carefully follow every detail of every other treatment these patients received is in that paper. So I think that would perhaps address a lot of the problems of eyes we fail on that at the right selected, carefully done case, just like the melphalan in intravitreal wasn't done. It has to be implemented very carefully, but that is one thing that could change the future going forward. I'm also aware of, of a couple research things that are going on where um, you can have a small uh, disc of chemotherapy that's placed next to the eye that gives long-term um, medication within the eye, and that may avoid uh, things like uh, intravitreal injections or systemic chemotherapy or intraarterial, and uh, that's in the pipeline uh, of research. There's also drugs that bind to certain tumors that are activated by light, uh, and retinoblastoma may be one of those types of um, uh, tumors that that type of drug could target. So there are things that are going on uh, in, in research and clinical development that can be applied to retinoblastoma. So I think it's a, it, it's a widely changing and, and uh, open field because there's going to be better ways to treat this, and I'm confident of that. Okay, Sammy gets a, the last question, then we move okay. forward. Yeah. So now with the, all these treatments, what are the primary indications of enucleation? And again, what are these secondary causes? When do you give up on an eye? So I have a, a strong feeling that if, if you have good vision in one eye and you have really poor visual potential that there is uh, benefit for doing uh, a nucleation in an advanced eye in a unilateral case. And there are exceptions to that rule, but that still, I think, it applies because it's a, it's a good treatment. For recurrent tumors, I think that, you know, there are certain can cancer tumors that don't die no matter what we do to them. And if you've tried everything uh, once, I think that that's enough to, to say that, you know, you've given your best uh, effort and you've done everything known to man to try to salvage this eye, that's the time uh, that I would recommend a nucleation. 
those are my two kind of standard things. Uh, there are heroic efforts that we have to, we do sometimes. However, those are the exception, not the rule. Okay, so do you think that it is a medical decision to enucleate? It is the decision of the physician, or it is a combined decision of the physician and the parents? It so has to be a combined decision. Uh, the, phys the physician's job is to kind of uh, inform you of your choice and the risks of your choice. And if they're not giving you all the information of that choice, then you, know, you, you have to get that out of them. Uh, you know, we can give you a guidance on if you want to try to save this eye, this can happen, and this risk increases, and this uh, visual potential goes down. So there's all these things where we can tell you that what happens if you try to save the eye um, and the risk that you take when you go down that road. However, sometimes it's, it's more uh, efficacious to remove it and keep everybody safe. So that's actually a great, a great way to end this session by saying that's something that we see Hope USA could lead in to help put together the information for informed consent for all these circumstances to arm new parents and, and ongoing parents for advocating for their own care. Thank you. All right, I'd like to ask our next group to come on up here. This is the parent advocate panel, which I know everyone's looking very much for. 